Well, we've uh, learned much about constructs and in various fields of study, sometimes I call the real world. <clears throat> it's not unusual. It's basically the same thing. That is, in learning theory, for example, as late as 1980, researchers were noticing that people have infrastructure or scaffolding, and these are uh, mental positions, elements of knowledge that are intended to provide a scaffolding upon which more or additional knowledge can be built and based. But like we all are prone to do, uh, for example, in organizations where someone says they have years and years, maybe decades of experience, it's not unusual to find that they've been, they've actually functioned with just a few months of knowledge that they acquired initially on a job, for example. And then let's say a 30-year employee or a 30-year manager might have simply functioned for the past 29 and a half years on that initial six months of learning that became his scaffolding of those support structures. So he would know key people, let's say critical things about, let's say, a safety or some methods of operation. Uh, he then might know, uh, you know, the culture or history of an organization. So let's say four major things, that becomes his scaffolding. And according to that, he functions. And it's not unusual, especially in situations where you are performing a consultative role to find people pushing back against additional knowledge. They don't find it meaningful because it always, uh, well, usually it can be reduced to how will that help me since I can do what I need to do. It's a get by ism type attitude. Well, when, for example, I personally have experienced if you evaluate Calvinism, for example, the chief of soteriological constructs, or creationism, the young earth recent novel uh, construct that has really uh, taken a lot of uh, interest uh, or gained a lot of interest. And, you know, I've watched people go back and forth between young earth and old earth, nothing uh, unusual about that. It, prior to that, it was Calvinism, Arminianism, young or old earthism. It's, it's now Protestant Catholicism, whether you're speaking of theistic traditions or ecclesiology. So, <clears throat> so what is it now to help us understand, especially as a pastor of a church, to help members where I pastor? Well, what we've learned as a church is that people come our way, and, and everyone does, originating from uh, whatever source of priming uh, and however their scaffolding was built. And some, regrettably, don't actually have an infrastructure. They just have, let's say, an anti-Arminian or an anti-Calvin or anti-Catholic or anti-Protestant or anti-religion, whatever it is. So they really don't have a working knowledge of the Bible, for example, let's say of literature, where it would occur to them meanings of words, definitions, uh, context in which that word appears, or perhaps even what was the original intention of the original author? Uh, how would the original receptors have heard this information and received it? So to say all uh, that is just simply to come to the conclusion that, um, for example, Calvinists are just as likely, people who identify themselves according to that fallible religious construct, to react to the fact that, for example, let's say one of the uh, pillars, you know, T-U-L-I-P, that becomes the scaffolding. Well, for example, total depravity becomes total inability. Okay, so you have to transist from what you heard said and asserted by some Calvinists to something else. Similar to the statement original sin, for some people that means original culpability, and they go into this lengthy uh, explanation for why babies die and end up in hell or something, because they want to preserve their assertion that original sin equals original culpability. Now that's also not in the Bible. But among Calvinism, Calvinism itself, you can find assertions as regeneration precedes faith. That's 
impossible to find in any biblical Hebrew text or Koine Greek text. That is to find fathered out from God prior to the finite verb believe. Now, one can find it prior to believing a participle, but not before the action. But why is that so disturbing? Because the same reason in organizations, whether it be sales, manufacturing, retail, or any other organizations with whom I'm very familiar, uh, people just simply have a natural aversion toward expanding and building on that knowledge if it carries no meaningful implication. And many times in a workplace, if the person's comfortable with a routine, uh, there's not a lot to have to think about on their job, then they have a highly engaged life outside of the workplace or work organization. Uh, people in academics, same thing. They achieve a certain position in the learning organization, uh, and then they teach and never the same students twice. Uh, in a seminary, a professor might teach from the same notes for 30 years but he never teaches it to the same students. So since people have a natural inclination to prefer scaffolding and infrastructure, for example, the five points of Calvinism, the points of Arminianism, pillars of Islam, uh, even a book written by a Baptist, pillars of orthodoxy, we all want to know what are the core things we believe. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't always lead to the intended purpose of having those stabilizers in our uh, portfolio of knowledge. For example, open or closed theism, neither of those actually uh, are taught in the Bible. The Bible doctrine, living God, living theism, if you will, let's say over 50 times that phrase appears. In other places, we're living in true God. So who wants to bother, if you will, to locate all of those phrases, living God, then contextualize them, that is, place them in their context and then evaluate that context and then look at the genre of literature in which it occurs, look at the time of which it was written, consider the authorship, consider the original hearers, and then apply lexical syntactical analysis. So I find the need for Calvinism, five points, or the need for Arminianism, five points, or the need for even an acronym that we have here at our church and other men I work with, SCARS, S-C-A-R-S. That's certainly a scaffolding that someone can, for example, like pitch a tent. You could take that. And you're in business now. We have something to build on, something to work with. But if it's not appraised as meaningful, that is, if it doesn't return on the invested effort of study, for example, then you know someone who says they uh, have embraced the fallible religious construct, pre-tribulation rapturism. It's very sensational. It's very popular. It's achieved its place on the shelf of fallible religious constructs. But only those who've measured and done the marketing analysis know that there's a great return on the investment. People have a great interest in, just give me the five points of this. Give me the five points of that. Give me the four points of this. Just Tell me if you're pre or mid trip. It's, it's, for example, exemplified by those of us who are, are expository teachers. You will be going, let's say, progressing through a text and considering each verse and placing it in a context and having a rational expression of that particular context prepared and based on meanings from a time that is no more and uh, an implication that might have never been considered by your audience. And then you find them waiting while you're going, let's say, verse by verse through a book called The Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And I've had it happen to me so many times, I, I don't even care to count, or nor even care when it happens. It, it's as though, okay, now we appreciate you telling us these things we could have never known. None of us have ever researched etymology. We've never considered hermeneutics. We've never done lexical syntactical analysis. But are you pre-trib or are you post-trib or... They're prepared with stored energy to pounce on you if you're not whatever it is they think based on original priming and their internal scaffolding 
you should or should not be. So, so it's not a surprise or a disappointment, but it, it, I wasn't prepared when I evaluated uh, these constructs, this scaffolding in religion. I wasn't prepared to find the same symptoms among people and then to go to and evaluate assertions by people who claim to be uh, believers of a gospel that can be known in the Bible to say that they've trusted into Jesus and they've accepted the purpose for that to be declared right out from his faith and his faithfulness. Well, then to see them just as uh, easily shaken uh, if they perceive their scaffolding upon which they're standing to be a house of cards. And Calvinists especially, I, I wasn't expecting that uh, because the ones I studied were in history and people accused of being Calvinist in history did not seem to uh, bear the instability or, or express the instability of those who would uh, add to their knowledge or evaluate their assertions. Uh, I don't perceive... Uh, People today to have be to be as stable, or it could be you know something I wouldn't be surprised, but it would be disappointing to think that people would prefer the pragmatic advantages of just five points of Calvinism, a young Earth assertion, and then a pre-trib left behind, and then let's just move on. I don't know to what we're moving on if building our knowledge and learning, uh, especially when I notice uh, living theism is not in the conversation. Because word living is inevitable. We, we can't place it in a finite expression. That is, we can't express it according to finite understanding. But we know we're alive. Of course, if you attend a philosophy class, that's not necessarily the case. So you'll find people speaking of Descartes and his perception theory. You'll see people asserting, I think, therefore I am. It's, it's a strange benefit of prosperity and time to contemplate, but it, it would be best served as we were taught in the Missionary Baptist Seminary to labor in word and doctrine to give ourselves to the word of God and to prayer continuously. <clears throat> now that would find you leaving behind a lot of this that's unnecessary. And I'm not destabilized when I learned that no text anywhere in the biblical Hebrew nor in the Koine Greek uh, places regeneration have it that is being fathered out from God prior to the finite verb to believe. That didn't disturb me. It didn't disturb me, for example, when open and closed theism were neither Bible expressions. Uh, living theism was very much enjoyed, and I am certainly uh, enjoying what I'm learning about the implication of that, especially when we start with Christ, the way, the truth, the life. If, if he is the one according to whom life is defined, then very fascinating are those of us who support uh, Christ and his gospel in studying the implication of living theism. So uh, the fact that predestination, election, for example, are in church letters, that's, that's a hermeneutical matter that has implications. So we build on that. So those who refuse to move from their ego-centered, self-centered uh, soteriology, and then to move to those texts, perhaps having greater implication on what the Lord's doing through his churches on the earth. Uh, that's something that may never find remedy in this lifetime. It's few people who actually study and search the scriptures and then more research the scriptures. So uh, that's just a good uh, explanation in a very concise, succinct way to let you know that when you touch someone's scaffolding, they literally are acting as though a person would if you went up to someone alongside a towering building and were multi-stories high on a scaffolding and you began to shake it. Uh, it's called in academic research the shaking of a schema. Well, just take those abstract words away, but if you begin to literally shake on a physical scaffolding on which someone is standing, that becomes very disconcerting. Now, for those of us who've moved on beyond the scaffolding, we are actually in the permanent structure, if you will. Our feet are on a solid rock. So nothing we support and advocate in the scriptures can be shaken. So when 
we come across people as pastors in New Testament churches, specifically the ones I associate deliberately with in the American Baptist Association, we'll hear people come from all types of places and they're very, very, very hard and seldom, I mean, very difficult to find are people stabilized and actually grown up to the full measure of the stature of Christ and have grown to be uh, approved workmen who need not to be ashamed but are able to rightly divide the word of God, the word of truth. So uh, to be able to rightly handle the word of God, but again, if, if that isn't perceived as meaningful to people, as a lot of times pragmatism or a, a bad attitude just says, well, what will that do for me? So I, I remind people, patiently remind as pastors, all pastors do, that what we study is first for the interest of God's glory. And secondly, it collaterally extends to the benefit of our fellow man, our neighbor. And ultimately, it all serves the interest of Christ. So our flesh is quick to evaluate things and say, what is this doing for me? And we have many uh, voices in the world uh, appealing to us saying, you're just wasting your time. You're serving an interest that is not in this world. So yes, our work is transcendent. And again, to move living theism to the top of the list, to move instant and spoken creation back to verse one of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, it's not, you don't find many people going upstream to do that, but all people who study and search and then research the scriptures and those of us who've come out, severed our ties and have submitted ourselves gladly to being baptized into uh, a body of Christ in a particular area to then fellowship into the gospel and to participate in the great commission of disciple making. Uh, it, we know it's always up and it's always upstream so this just helped you understand a little better uh, because I don't I don't find anything out there I don't have pet constructs uh, that well we dare not evaluate it because when Calvinism was invented it was uh, long before any of us today were alive and when Arminianism the precursor of that was invented it was long before any of us and when pre-tribulation began to be developed as a construct it was long before us so uh, no one can take it personally unless they've appropriated some type of identity with it that would be seemingly i would consider that very unhealthy uh, mentally speaking for example even evaluating landmarkism and quickly seeing where among landmarkers these fallible constructs have been treated with the same respect as an actual landmark, an actual scripture, or an actual context. So sorting that out is difficult because a lot of us can't distinguish between our fallible construct and the infallible context. But it takes work, and then when we learn, as we do here at Landmark Missionary Baptist Church through our apologetic and outreach ministry of imcornet.org, we publish that, uh, Dr. John Penn and his hermeneutics baptistlamp.org, Lamp Theological Institute, publishes it quickly. Uh, he taught us buy the truth and sell it not. So it's a divestiture of ourselves. It's a diminished return on the investment as far as the gain that otherwise would be uh, pursued by people. So you don't really, uh, you and I will never meet anyone who constructed these things even the ministry of William Lane Craig, the unsurpassed apologist and philosophy and theologian uh, in one person, uh, advocates Molinism, but he's not Mr. Molina. <laughs> so uh, I would have preferred uh, William Lane Craigism over Molinism because I think he's far more advanced than anything to which he references in the past. So with that in mind, uh, it's certainly not unusual for people to go backwards and take a scaffolding, let's say five points of Calvinism or five points of Arminianism or pillars of Orthodox, and then use those as the end rather than the original foundation upon which to build uh, meaningful knowledge and to gain and acquire that knowledge and then through it to grow in the grace and the knowledge of a person, the person, Jesus the Christ. So you have a blessed day, but if you feel unstable or destabilized when someone evaluates your scaffolding, 
maybe it's something you should be experiencing because you're now beginning to learn and add to your knowledge. Uh, and if that's uncomfortable, so be it. Just recognize it as the flesh and, and proceed. And God will be glorified by it. And you certainly don't have to be emotional or emotionally uh, outrageous. You don't have to express vitriol. And, and as I tell people, I don't know what to say to people who don't know what they're talking about. So Adam, assertions and elevated voices and red-faced and clenched fists don't do anything to uh, etymologically derive the meaning of a word. So uh, you have a blessed day and, and enjoy gaining knowledge and appreciating your neighbor and how he might not be prepared uh, and as stable as you are when you present more knowledge and insight to the word of God. So you have a blessed day.